Welcome to Inside Brussels. This is the latest episode of the European Conservatives news show, where we talk to decision makers and experts looking at what kind of impact EU policies and legislation will have on your everyday lives as Europeans. Behind me, you can see some images of a propaganda video that was released by the European Parliament. It educates Europeans on what's right and wrong and shows what happens to those countries who refuse to subscribe to Brussels' liberal agenda. If you break the rules, you lose, they say. Back when the EU treaties were drawn up, the rule of law as a concept was rightfully regarded as one of the core foundations of a civilized democratic Europe. In the hands of the European Commission, however, it seems that it has been turned into a weapon to be used by the Brussels bureaucracy against democracy and national sovereignty. Put simply, the rule of law has been turned into lawfare, an abuse of the legal system to damage and delegitimize political opponents with the ultimate aim to destroy the plurality of values and ideas in the struggle for an ever closer union. When it comes to calling out the rule of law violations, Brussels' double standards have become painfully apparent in the last few months. The greatest and most recent example is Hungary. Despite its overwhelming democratic mandate, Hungary's conservative government is now threatened with another infringement procedure that would prevent its, it from exercising its rights in the EU just because it refuses to accept migrant quotas and move to protect children from gender propaganda. On the other hand, hundreds of thousands have been protesting the socialist Spanish government's proposed amnesty deal with Catalan separatists a deal that violates the country's constitution and undermines Spanish democracy. Yet, Brussels has done nothing to stop it. What's more, it even assists in legitimizing Pedro Sanchez's actions, a complete violation of the rule of law. The situation is even worse in Poland, whose new left-wing government under the lifelong bureaucrat Donald Tusk has begun its purge. There are mass layoffs in the public sphere, including media, administration, and even the courts, to eliminate all contrarian voices. After 35 years of democracy, Poland once again has political prisoners unlawfully jailed. And how did Brussels react to these clear breaches of the rule of law? With cheers and encouragement. These, are, these three examples, which we will look at today, perfectly demonstrate how the rule of law has been hijacked in Brussels and subjected to political schemes that disregard democracy, sovereignty and subsidiarity. Tenets that were and are still instrumental to making the European project benefit all Europeans. Before we turn to our first guest, Herman Tersch, a lawyer, journalist, and member of the European Parliament since 2019, representing the Spanish Vox Party in the European Conservative and Reformist Group, let us watch our reporter Tomás Orbán recap last week's decision against Hungary in the European Parliament. The European Parliament just adopted a resolution calling for the Council to open an Article 7 procedure against Hungary. The aim of the nuclear option, as it's often referred to, is to strip the country from its voting rights and prevent it from assuming the rotating presidency this July. During the debate, MEPs from both conservative parties came to the defense of the country, pointing out the apparent double standards in Brussels when it comes to the rule of law, saying that while the EU remains silent about the blatant violations undertaken by leftist governments in Spain and Poland, it engages in ideological lawfare against conservative governments. Nonetheless, the Parliament's resolution carries no binding effect, as triggering Article 7 still requires the unanimous approval of all the remaining member states, which remains unlikely, given that many of them would refrain to setting such a dangerous precedent. I'm Tomasz Orban for the European Conservative. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. 
many people have been watching the unprecedented demonstrations all over Spain, but the, the legal and constitutional details of Sanchez's amnesty law is somewhat still obscure. How would you briefly explain what happened in the country and its implications for the rule of law uh, to someone outside of Spain? Well, obscure is an understatement. I mean, the, the law of amnesty is directly criminal. It's illegal. It's expressly forbidden in the Spanish constitution. It is an amnesty. It's an impunity law for all the criminals who are part of a group who has seven votes, which Sanchez needs to stay in government. So Sanchez is giving impunity to criminals eh, so that he receives seven votes for seven votes. I mean, that's a really obnoxious uh, way of understanding uh, democracy. It's not democracy. They are, they are violating grossly Spanish constitutional law and the law in general, and they are making an alliance with many different criminals which brings us to an unprecedented situation in Spain where we can clearly speak about the coup d'etat. I mean, it's a putsch. What do we see here? You know, we have a government that breaks grossly all rules to stay in government, although they could not, they wouldn't be able to do that without, without breaking constitution and the law. That means uh, we are now in for confronting um, an illegal, illegitimate government who is ready, as we see, is ready to break every kind of law. Now, yesterday, the next concessions to the criminals was that this amnesty, they said till the day before yesterday, that this amnesty would, uh, would cover embezzlement, theft, uh, all kinds of, of, different, of different criminal acts and the, 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 the breaking of the Constitution and the uprising against the Constitution and the violent uprising of the Constitution. And now, yesterday, they said they would include terrorism. That means terrorism gets impunity in Spain if it's done by, uh, by Catalan separatists and which f who favor the votes for Mr. Sanchez staying in government. It's, I mean... It's really a, it's, it's an incredible development in a European country. Many conservative parties in the European Parliament have been trying to hold Sanchez accountable. Uh, do you think that your efforts in Brussels could still have any effect, seeing that the European Commission seemingly doesn't really care about the rule of law violations in Spain? Well, uh, let's be sincere. Uh, not with this commission. This commission has been covering up all uh, the misbehaviors and uh, indeed, indeed crimes that uh, Sanchez has, uh, has uh, made. And, and we have seen also uh, this commission has been pouring money into Spain uh, with money from this COVID regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, saying the generation, new generation funds and so on. Nobody knows, nobody has the slightest idea with where this money is, where these funds are. And still these funds have been coming in in Spain, pouring into the government of Mr. Sanchez so that Sanchez could finance all uh, what he has been developing for st stabilizing his, his uh, first government and now the second one, which is illegal. So in this sense, we can't expect anything from von der Leyen or von Reinders, uh, but uh, we think that they will change. And we think for uh, slowly in whole Europe, it's, it starts to be quite obvious that Sanchez is a danger not only for Spain, that Sanchez is a, is a danger for all Europe. Sanchez has attitudes uh, towards, towards oppositions, towards the democratic rules, towards law itself, uh, which, are, which are far away from every kind of, of democratic uh, habits in Europe. 
and are very close to what uh, normally tyrannies, dictatorships in Latin America used to uh, used to uh, do. They are all the instruments of intimidation, of threats towards the judges and towards the people itself, and the demagoguery, uh, uh, which they use is very much closer to Maduro eh, uh, than to anybody else, eh, closer to Evo Morales, closer to Rafael Correa, to Daniel Ortega, to the Cuban way of seeing, of seeing the opposition. I mean, they have very close, close relations to Venezuela. The corruption of the Socialist Party is very linked to the corruption in Venezuela, not only to the drug cartels that uh, run the Foro de Sao Paulo in the whole Latin American sphere. Uh, we are in the Grupo de Puebla and Foro de Sao Paulo. The Socialist Party is, Spanish Socialist Party is, as the communists are, they are members of the Grupo de Puebla. The Grupo de Puebla you have in the, in the people who are the dictators, they are guerrillas, they are terrorists, there are all kinds of people inside, all kinds of people who have nothing to do, all of them enemies of the democracy. Eh? And still you have the Socialist Party and the, and the Communist Parties of Spain, Podemos and the others, you have them inside. No? So eh, the Spanish government and the Spanish alliance now is a, is a, a bunch eh, of forces who, who really have nothing to do with a uh, with social democracy in the traditional way that Europeans used to understand uh, you can be very critical I am indeed very critical with social democracy in the terms of uh, Helmut Schmidt or even Willy Brandt if you want to but it has nothing to do with this and here we are speaking about people who use uh, criminal criminal methods to maintain their power, to expand their power, or to grasp power. Last week in Strasbourg, you called out the Brussels mainstream's double standards when it comes to the rule of law and the weaponization of it against conservative governments. Do you think that this trend will be stronger in the coming years? No, I, I, I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I think it, it has been incredibly obscene. Uh, the, the whole behavior of, of von der Leyen and the Commission in, in general, the Commission towards Hungary and towards Poland, I think it has been unbearable, and cynical. What, what we have seen in all these years, in all these plenaries, inventing every kind, every kind of pretexts to, to add excuses to, to, to bashing on. There's this Hungarian bashing and Poland bashing. No? that we saw. Uh, we'll see what happens with Slovakia, we'll see what happens with any anyone who, who takes a conservative way. Uh, but this is uh, close to the end. I mean, and on the contrary, the double standard is that they have been covering up and financing generously with money from other countries. Eh? They have been generally financing uh, this way to hell that we are seeing in, in Spain, which is, as I say, overtly criminal. Meanwhile, other European countries' funds are frozen. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, the funds of Hungary or Poland and so on have been frozen till they have they they could manage to to let's say topple in, in, in an alliance between Brussels, Donald Tusk, and Berlin. They could they could get rid of the conservative government in uh, in Poland. Oh, that's uh, that's. A, one of the a, developments of this of this persistence of the Commission in 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 the attacks on on Poland, uh, they are far away of of uh, uh, but they would like to do the same with Hungary. I think they will they, they won't manage to 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 do that. Uh, but I think the times are coming when we are uh, June is coming nearer. Uh, they have few months now to to continue with all this this kind of, of, of measures which are unjustified and many of them really anti-democratic, perverse, and cynical. And I think after the 9th of June, uh, we will have a different, different perspective 
we will have a very different commission as well, and we will have uh, an, an, an another another correlation of forces in the parliaments uh, who can correct many of the of the tendencies that we have seen disastrous tendencies in many aspects in any in many as aspects and especially in this kind of a how do you say a they have they couldn't care less about the interests of the nations and of the people and of the democratic will of the people in the different nations they want really to suppress individual freedoms they want to uh, impose social engineering and social disciplines uh, which are absolutely contrary and opposite to to every tradition of freedom in, in our in our society in our western societies in this sense a uh, this perversion that has that came in with the commission with this commission especially with the ursula von der leyen commission uh, should end abruptly uh, after the 9th of june and i hope very much that the conservative forces will have a majority for the first time in the history of this parliament the ppe will have no no excuses eh, for looking always to vote together with the socialists they will have other majorities to choose and then we will see what they do if they if they stay voting with the socialists it's not because there's nothing else to do but it, it is because they are really betraying betraying their voters as as in so many cases it has been the uh, the case and so uh, i think the times are changing and i look uh, into the future with well, hopefully, hopefully i sincerely hope that your predictions are correct <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much mr tash the second guest joining us in the studio is Gergely Dobozy, a lawyer, a political researcher at the Budapest-based think tank, the New Institute, one of the main goals of which is to explore the related concepts of democracy and the rule of law. But before I invite Mr. Dobozy to join me in the studio, I'll just watch an interview with MEP Balázs Hidvégi from Hungary's Fidesz delegation, whom we asked about the situation in Poland and the rule of law debates in Strasbourg. Apart from Spain, Poland is another country that Brussels is completely silent about. Uh, what has been going on in the country since Donald Tusk's election and what is the EU institution's reaction? Well, Donald Tusk has um, engaged in a political revenge campaign, basically trampling on the rule of law, on the most basic principles of democracy. It's very clear uh, they are breaking the law, they're breaking the Polish constitution. Um, and in a very cynical way, they... Uh, a claim to be uh, now returning uh, to uh, democracy, returning to the rule of law. And uh, Brussels uh, is an accomplice in this. Uh, they have been completely silent. Not even a question has been raised uh, about uh, these moves and about these developments. Um, uh, this shows how completely um, uh, without credit uh, the whole talk here in Brussels about the rule of law is and how it has, uh, you know, uh, developed into a, a cynical political uh, blackmail against conservative uh, governments. If somebody uh, who is their friend, like Donald Tusk, uh, is breaking every possible rule and law, um, uh, but um, uh, that's something that they like, then it's okay. Uh, no question is raised. If a conservative government uh, does something completely legally and according to law and according to the Constitution, um, that doesn't matter. They are attacked. Nevertheless, uh, calling uh, on the or, or claiming that it's a rule of law violation. So it's a completely um, uh, discredited um, uh, discourse here in Brussels about the rule of law. You participated in multiple debates uh, about Hungary's rule of law situation in, in Strasbourg last week alongside Commission President von der Leyen. What do you think will be the development of this dispute? Well, uh, we are just... Um, six months now from the elections, European elections, and I think um, uh, some things are becoming clearer or clearer. If anybody ever had any doubt about um, uh, the, root, the, the source of the political attacks against Hungary, uh, Madame von der Leyen made it very clear uh, last week uh, what the real uh, reasons are. She mentioned our child protection law, 
that protects children from LGBTI uh, propaganda at schools and protects uh, parents' rights to raise their children as they, as they uh, see best. Um, and uh, she also cited um, our stance against illegal migration. She called it the refugee, the asylum situation, but really it is the Hungary, it is the Hungarian position that says no to illegal migration and that does things to prevent uh, illegal migrants uh, from entering. Uh, that is a problem in Brussels. Um, clearly, those are positions that we're not going to be uh, able to, to make a compromise on because uh, these are about national identity, these are about national interests, um, and, um, and no money, no EU money is, is more valuable than to protect our children from LGBTI propaganda and to prote protect our national identity from illegal uh, migration. So uh, those areas are there and we're going to maintain our positions even if um, not everybody in Brussels like those. The Parliament adopted two resolutions calling for another Article 7 procedure against Hungary. Do you think the Council would go that far? I don't think so. Um, this is also part of the campaign mood that is now uh, here in Brussels uh, everywhere. Um, the European Parliament and its left um, uh, has gone to, an, to a point where they want to take away Hungary's right to vote, suspend our participation in European affairs just because we happen to disagree on some important issues, migration, uh, gender or the war, and what, what is best to do about that. Um, that really uh, endangers now, uh, endangers now the European cooperation as such. You can't have uh, the EU where only one possible opinion is accepted. Uh, the EU is about uh, discourse, the EU is about um, the plurality of views uh, uh, within the continent. You have to accept that to be able to have a successful European Union. <music> Mr. Dobozi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. The Hungarian government um, has been constantly accused of um, violating the rule of law by the Brussels mainstream. Uh, but beyond that uh, vague term, um, what what is Hungary actually uh, being accused of? And what does Budapest mean when it says ideological blackmail? When we talk about uh, ideological blackmailing, um, we are talking about uh, um, progressive in interpretation of concepts uh, uh, behind the phenomenon of migration and the uh, LGBTIQ community and activism. But I think it is just the tip of the iceberg because uh, uh, on, the, on top of the iceberg, there's, um, um, you can call it a source code for deeper European integration, and um, it is rooted in the founding treaties. I'm talking about the uh, close, about the ever closer union. Um, and uh, I think I won't uh, say any surprise when saying that um, by ever by an ever closer union, uh, the Brussels mainstream uh, mean um, deeply rooted European integration a feder with a, fe a strongly federalistic approach. And uh, now you see in Hungary, um, the current government opposes this approach uh, with a, a stark sovereignist approach. So um, currently we can see that the Brussels mainstream, this Brussels mainstream uh, doesn't want strong arguments against uh, federalism and uh, the whole phenomena you can see around this uh, uh, rule of law uh, debate uh, is uh, it can be attributed to this um, dispute between sovereignists and federalists. 10 billion euros have been recently um, released uh, with about 20 billion euros still frozen by the Commission. Uh, why didn't Hungary get uh, its remaining uh, share of EU funds? And um, when would you expect that happening? My short, short answer to your last question is I don't know. And uh, for the question uh, before that is uh, it's because of the poor quality of legislation. We are talking about uh, legal instruments giving uh, very excessive powers to the European Commission 
uh, meaning that uh, the European Commission in this legal uh, framework can act unchecked and unbalanced. Um, so uh, we are talking about a situation in which uh, the European Commission is its, uh, in itself um, prosecutor, judge and an executioner. And uh, in this imbalanced situation, uh, Hungary can only do uh, its best uh, to ground its um, mm. measures taken, uh, which are which can be found on the internet uh, by uh, searching for the Hungarian uh, recovery plans and and uh, those measures already taken and planned to be taken uh, by the government. But uh, I'm rather pessimistic about uh, that this uh, European Commission in this term will um, resolve on this topic. What do Hungarians generally think about what's what's been happening in Brussels? Um, does uh, this dispute have any effect on, on domestic politics and the, the government's public perception back home? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, the um, disputes uh, revolving around uh, this topic in uh, Budapest uh, are very colorful. And um, when I'm saying this, uh, I'm denying the narratives uh, around uh, any kind of hooksit. Uh, we don't want a uh, hooksit. And um, we think that uh, we Hungarian, we conservative Hungarians, but I, I can speak in the name of the uh, modest liberals as well. Um, we do think that uh, the European, U European Union has to be reformed from within. Um, so yeah, it, uh, the whole debate uh, forms the public discourse around uh, uh, the Euro European Union, but uh, we are trying to find uh, constructive solutions uh, to this matter. Um, regarding your question about um, the approach towards this European Commission is uh, very similar to a situation at a juncture uh, when the car in front of you breaks down and uh, the driver wants to ignite the engine. And uh, there are some drivers who are patient. There are some uh, drivers who start honking the horn. Uh, there are more radical approaches as well, but uh, we are still waiting for the end game. Thank you so much, Mr. Dembozy. Thank you. Thank you.